If people in an area feel like they want to revive a language, then um, they um, teach the curriculum in a classroom, in a school, in the target language. Like if, um, just in this area, if you wanted kids to learn the Yupik language, then you teach the school curriculum all in Yupik, you know, hoping that uh, the students will learn how to speak Yupik again. Well, here at the immersion program, we try to um, emulate the regular curriculum. And so we have um, started out the day with an opening attendance, going through our daily jobs, having math, using manipulatives, um, covering other subjects like PE, having song and dance, having language arts, social studies, science. The big difference is um, the language that, that we're delivering the program in. Here, we're 100% Yupik. Some of the research shows that children that are um, learning a second language, even if they lag for a while in English, will um, catch up with their peers that are in an, in an English-only program, and you know, some um, will pass. They learn faster. When students come in August and they don't speak a word of Yupik, August through October, I think, are the most frustrating months of the year because both uh, the students are frustrated, the parents are frustrated, I'm frustrated, but then you have to do a lot of modeling. If I sit down, I'll say akume, akumo. If I stand up, I'll say nangkhla. And you know, a lot of uh, Bupik words have gestures, like if I say dai dai, we usually just say dai dai. We use our, I guess what we, we use is total physical response. We use our body to tell the students what to do. So we use a lot of commands and we, we use our body motions, gestures, just to get the communication skills going. <laughs> I sit with the students, and then I assign one student to come up here and point to the names. As the child is pointing to each name, the children say the child's name. Like, for instance, there's a little girl named Akhanaujok. If the child uh, is here, then they'll say Akhanaujok Mantok. That's Akhanaujok is present today. But if she's not here, then say Akhanaujok Chattaiduk. So if the little child is here, then See, uh, the, uh, the little ch uh, card for uh, Mantok is yellow, and the card for Chattaito is green. So if the little girl is here, she comes up and just flips her uh, card over to yellow, meaning she's present. And so the child who is assigned to point to all the names goes through all the girls and then the boys. And then after we're done, I normally say, how many girls are absent today? So the kids tell me, like if three girls are absent, being I am not gonna it. Then we come over here. Like how many boys are absent today? They'll say if two boys are absent, they'll say malaguk And then we do a little math. If three girls are gone today and two boys are gone, how many children are absent today? So we go through the whole process of you know doing math. We go to PE class over at ME, but the ME teacher, PE teacher is working with two of our aides, and he tells the aides what to do, and he doesn't speak to the kids. The aides talk to the kids in Newpick. <laughs> so 
They have a cafeteria over there, but we don't walk over to eat. We eat right in the classroom. You know, there's a lot of small things that um, are done just in this building because we can't be exposed to the English language. The students are learning these in a second language, in a target language. That's the Yupik language. They might not be speaking, you know, the full language, but they understand what to do. You know, people just didn't believe that it would work. Even now, there's a lot of parents who believe that, you know, their children are going to be very frustrated even though we're teaching the same curriculum. And they just don't realize that, you know, we deliver the curriculum, only it's delivered in Yupik. So we're still uh, meeting a lot of skeptics out there. I think it's very important to have a um, Yupik immersion program, namely to maintain our Yupik language, which is a big chunk of our Yupik heritage. And <clears throat> I've read some um, articles about how native languages are slowly dying away. And this is a good one good way of um, preventing the loss of the Yupik language. The elders know that the language is going to die because they keep hearing their children, their grandchildren, speak in more and more English. And um, I thought, you know, what a great gift for us to give back to our parents. They gave it to us. And if they realize that we're trying to keep their language alive, I think they'd be, you know, real happy about what we're trying to do. In 1986, Dr. John Antonin, the superintendent, asked me to call all the certified native teachers into Dillingham for a meeting. And then he got us together and he said, we, we were born in the villages, we grew up in the villages, we went to the village schools, and then we became educated and are now back in the villages teaching school. Who best would give guidance to the school board than us teachers who had grown up within the area. We tried to give guidance to the board, but, but of course our teachers were still unsure. They were still, you know, we, you have the non-native supervisors who are the principals. You have a lot of non-native teachers within the school system. And somehow you, you never measure up to them since you're native, since you're of the area. And they're always trying to change you to make you like they are. And somehow, in the back of your mind, in the back of lots of people's mind, people from the outside are better, that you should be like them. And so they weren't really able to guide the school board members. So we decided that we needed to really look at what our Yupik teachers were doing. You know, what's Yupik about the way that you're teaching? What's you pick about the classroom that they're in with the, with the existing bilingual programs? One of the things that we noticed within the classroom was that always, even with the bilingual programs, it was always English-based. It wasn't you pick based knowledge. 
So we said, well, we need our elders to help guide us, to give us the kinds of knowledge and training that they knew and learned. We began to collect this Yupik knowledge base. One of the first things we talked about to our elders was, how did you traditionally count? Because, of course, you count at one, two, three, four, five, then you translate at Tao Chakmal, Pingan, Stam, and Tahliman, and no thought is really given to the name until we had our elders count for us. They were at Tao Chakmal, Pingan, Stam, and Tahliman, and Tahlik is an arm, so you have Tahliman. Arvinulgan is to cross over, so you're crossing over, connecting to the to the other finger. And then when you reach Kula, Kula is the top part. So Kula is ten. And and then you then we found out that we had a sub -ba uh, base twenty counting system with a sub base of five, based on the knowledge that our elders shared with us. We have a unit on weather. We have a unit on um, on patterns, the traditional Yupik border patterns. We have uh, several different units on the um, different legends that we integrated into the school system. We have a unit on the heartbeat. The heartbeat unit was sort of born with uh, Ina Bowker. And it so happened to be February, and we were trying to figure out how to integrate the patterns into the mathematical program. I gave them a diagram of the heart, and I spelled the word heart within the diagram, and I asked the kids, what words do we use that have the word heart in it? And a lot of the kids, what do we use? And one of the kids I remember had the word broken hearted. And so the other kids were thinking of the word, uh, different words within groups. I had the, I have the kids group so that they can work as a group, not as an individual. More words came out, heartless. And then the next day, I got a whole bunch of stethoscopes for the students to use, just to listen to their hearts. And the kids were really excited about it. Wow, my heart sounds different than yours. And they would discuss amongst themselves how different everyone's heartbeat was. And so from there, I got really excited about the patterns, the different patterns of heart heartbeats. I like to have the kids shut their eyes and just drum the drum for a while. Then I ask them, what kinds of things did it make them think of? And then they give different responses, and then we talk about the heartbeat. I have the kids feel their heartbeat. And when they feel their heartbeat, then we extend that to having them uh, make a pattern of that heartbeat. Then I have the kids listen to their heartbeat with a stethoscope. First they feel it, they show what it sounds like, then they listen to it, and then they also put it into pattern form. So we have them take the pattern that they put together and use the three main Yupik colors to make a pattern, because what they're going to do is they're going to make a bracelet using the beads. We have them do word problems based on the number of different colored beads that they use. And then from there, we get into all kinds of different mathematical activities. You get into addition, you get into subtraction, you get into different ratios. You could even get into different multiplication and division problems just based on, on their heartbeat and the bead creation that they put together. We extend it into the language arts where we have the students make poems. And one year we had the kids make poems and then attach their um, little poetry in their bracelet, and then they brought it as a gift home to their mother, showing their heartbeat and their poem. And this poem happens to read heartbeat, black, red, black, tick, tick, boom, soft beat is dreaming, cool. 
the heartbeat unit can go in all different emotional directions as well for the kids because at this age, really young age, you know, the kids, we have to make them feel good about themselves and be proud of who they are. And, and we could associate that with our culture, bring that in. This is what your culture is. This is what your culture is all about. This is what your grandfather's forefathers did. And they could learn so much from that. Kasegluk is a, an Eskimo village, Yupik Eskimo village, located about 25 miles west of Bethel. Uh, it's located on the Johnson River. It's uh, a population of Kasegluk is about 500 people. A Gula Lignovic school was built in 1980-81. Um, yeah, it was designed and planned for a K-12 program, which made it a little bit unique from the other Molly Hooch schools that were built for strictly for high school. Right now, we have about 93 students in our school, uh, K-12. We have seven teachers and seven certified teachers and five associate teachers. The, we run a, our Yupik Studies program uh, from kindergarten through the 12th grade. Uh, K-3 is dominant in Yupik, and then uh, 4 through 12 is they have two hours a day in uh, the Yupik Studies program. When we first came to Kasigluk, uh, Yupik was a dominant language. Uh, the only English that the students heard was the English in the school, which was for about six hours a day. <coughs> about uh, 20 years ago, <coughs> the television came in, telephones came in, uh, more modern technology came into the village. And so students and children, uh, they were, uh, they paid less and less attention to the elders and to the adults and their stories and their history of their culture and things like that. They were uh, concentrating on television and stuff, uh, and movies and videotapes and things like that. <coughs> And they begin to lose their language and also lose their culture. I had attended an outcome-based education program all about seven years ago and I got to thinking that if, if the people in the community really wanted to uh, preserve their culture and also their language that we needed to do something in the schools and the outcome-based education program at that time I felt was a was one of the uh, uh, vehicles to do that. And when we were going to do that, we had um, about three or four meetings for the whole winter, uh, starting from the fall time until in springtime. That was in reference to try to explain about uh, our program to the elders in the village. And since we have uh, started thinking that these elders are uh, passing away with their knowledge and wisdom of our own culture and traditions. And that it was the main thing that we had in mind when we brought this up and we tried to explain this to our elders uh, during our meetings. We had as high as 25 to 35 elders at every meeting. And we talked about the exit outcomes that they wanted their kids to have when they graduated from high school. Once we identified the exit outcomes, then we moved into the content areas, or the content of the exit outcomes. And again, we brainstormed with the community on that. And it took us about a year and a half to finally come up with a, a very extensive list of information that they wanted in these exit outcomes. All the walls were filled with charts here and there, and then 
um, we combine them together. And then after that, uh, we break them down into an area where, like uh, in old BIA days, in, in one of their curriculums, they um, have uh, written that we teach the, um, the berries or the fish in, right in the middle of a winter, whereas at that time, we're not fishing or berry picking. So keeping that in mind, we categorize each, whatever the elders have brought up to us, putting them into a certain uh, month or in uh, quarters or in semester when we would be covering them. At the end of about the third year, we started looking at a scope and sequence of the UPIC studies program. And it seemed like every time we'd come up with something that we were comfortable with, somebody in the uh, district office would say, yeah, but we could do this or we could do that, and change it a little bit. So we'd come back and we'd try to change it to meet uh, what they were looking for. And we went around and around with that for all oh, about a year. And finally, we came to the point of saying, well, wait a minute, this is Kasigla Karagula's UPIC studies program, and this is the way we want it set up. And so, from that point on, things seem to uh, smooth out a little bit. We've been at the process for six years, uh, and we're still working on it. This school year, we've been implementing the program as such as it, as it is. And hopefully at the end of this year, we'll re-critique what we've done and then develop the remaining thematic units to support it. Right now, the students um, in late April are working on birds and insects. Um, and we have kindergarten students that are uh, concentrating more on insects, um, the different types of insects that live around the, uh, our area. And then when they get into the uh, third and fourth grade, they're, they review the insects and uh, that, but then they're, they're looking more at the external parts of birds. Uh, we brought in some uh, ptarmigan and things like that, and the teacher, the associate teacher, is uh, talking about the external parts of these birds. And, and then they apply this uh, from the ptarmigan to the ducks and the other birds that are coming in. The fifth and sixth graders, they'll take the ptarmigan and they'll look at the internal parts of the ptarmigan. Uh, the heart, the liver, the intestines, and they actually dissect the ptarmigan and, and see what is, what's in there. Uh, then when they get into the seventh and eighth grade, they review the external parts and the internal parts, and also they get into uh, more of the uh, extended activities in terms of, of the habitat of the birds and where they live and why they live there and why they change uh, colors of their feathers or they molt and change uh, camouflage. The older students, they, they get into the migratory uh, birds and non, the migratory and non-migratory birds and uh, the reason that they migrate out and where do they go uh, when they do migrate. Uh, we use that as a stepping stone for social studies because then they can track the migratory paths of the birds all the way down into Mexico or uh, wherever they do go. It's uh, very complex. It's, uh, it's a kind of a, a gradual stepping stone, but by the time they do graduate from high school, they should have a fairly firm understanding of all the birds within the area and also whether they're migratory or non-migratory. And we've done that with all of the uh, thematic units. And the, uh, <clears throat> right now what we're doing is we're trying to take these uh, thematic units and develop lesson plans and uh, material lists and support materials, books, uh, activities and things to go along with them. We have two hour session, two or two class pair sessions for each class, for each grade level. 
And when we do that, we try to mostly cover the, uh, that anything that deals with the vocabulary, vocabulary reading and writing in that uh, thematic unit or in such a subject. And on the second period, we try to do some things that deals with enhanced activity that refers to what we are dealing with. And in that way, when, we're, when they're doing that, at the same time, they are taught some names of items or whatever, something like that, to build up their vocabulary. we bring in elders every day to have lunch with the kids and then they spend uh, two, three, four hours in the afternoon working in the classrooms. When they're not directly working with students, then usually we have an associate teacher or our, a librarian or a media specialist. He sits down and they interview the elders and collect more history and data from them at that time. This is the second year in which they've been paid for coming into the school. Uh, the five years prior to this, it's been strictly voluntary. When you mention cultural heritage or uh, bilingual education, a lot of times people think in terms of that it's strictly arts and crafts, um, making baskets, making fish traps, making dog sleds, making uh, or ba uh, weaving nets or whatever. The Yupik Studies program is uh, probably 90% content. That was the wishes of the elders. Uh, we had one of the elder ladies uh, who was uh, very uh, affluent in terms of uh, skin sewing, basket making, and those type of things. Her direct comment was, we want our kids to learn about our culture and our language. We don't want them spending all their time uh, skin sewing and making uh, molokai's uh, skin hats and things like that. We want them to learn the content. <laughs> We hold monthly meetings uh, here at Kasigluk at, or at Agula with, for the community. And we have a turnout of 25 <laughs> to 35 people at every meeting. I think that's a reflection of their interest in the UPIC Studies program or in uh, the program here. Um, we've had students um, compete on the state level uh, at the speech contest. Uh, I think that's a reflection of the students uh, feeling good about themselves and they're confident in themselves, they, they believe in themselves. And again, I, I'm in hopes that that's partly due to the UPIC Studies program, letting the students know who they are, where they are, or who they are and where they came from and that they should be proud of being UPIC. In the last 15 years, I, I know of no physical fights with older kids, uh, between older students. Um, we have very little uh, students talking back to teachers or to elders. And again, I think we, our UPIC Studies program teaches respect for elders and older people, and so I think that's a reflection of that. Um, and. I'm in hopes that our kids aren't into drugs and alcohol because, again, that they, through the UPIC Studies program, they, they feel good about themselves. And, you know, the elders come in and talk to them. And, uh, we have uh, other people coming in and congratulating them on their successes within our program. And I, I think it, they're, they're proud of their school, and I think a lot of it has to do with the UPIC Studies program.
So I, I think the uh, repercussions or the spin-off from the Yupik Studies program is not only learning about the Yupik history and the, and the Yupik language and their culture, but I think it's also uh, making our kids uh, really proud of who they are. And I think that's really important at this point. studies program could not have been successful if, if the people and the teachers hadn't been part of it. I mean, you, you can't sit behind a desk and develop it. It's, it's something that has to be developed with, uh, with everybody, and everybody has to have ownership to it. And, uh, I think it's there. I really do. Uh, um, and I'm very proud of those people that did participate in it. And we're willing to share. Una Juanija no tumsa putrixtinaxungayaxin, Tamara Kaufknaki, Nutum Saksuk.